Father God, I am just so honored and, and just so humble to be able to just allow you to speak through me today, Father God, and just let it be your words, not my words, Father, as we just honor you and as we attempt to learn and gain more wisdom from you. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're continuing in the series, The Net, and it's really interesting about The Net because, as most of you know, I am a, a network guy. I'm a behind-the-scenes guy. I'm not so much up front. Now, I'll do, you know, I don't mind doing the announcements and the little things like that because, you know, it's a few minutes and it's over. But, you know, I, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whoa, that's a, that's a big difference for a, a tech guy. But, you know, hey, if God needs to use me for this, that's, that's what we're going to do. Amen. So in the network, you know, in, in the tech world, the network is something that I work on all the time. And to make a network for the Internet, I think everybody in here has the Internet. And, you know, the Internet is just connected computers all over the world. You know, it had to start at one point with a couple of computers at a college, and then it expanded out and became a network. And it's interesting that that's exactly what happens in the kingdom of God as well. We can be a network. And so this is the fifth part of this. And today what I want to talk about is our time and our talents. You've heard that in, in threes, the time, talents, and treasures. Next week, Johnny's going to talk about the treasure. But what I want to focus on today is the time and the talent. And a lot of times that's called gifts. And we all have gifts, you know, I think, that God deposits gifts in our lives. And so for me particularly, you know, the gift that God deposited in my life was tech. You know, it wasn't so much standing up speaking, and in the beginning, it wasn't church at all. I didn't even know that I'd be part of a church. But I did know that that is something that God put in me that would eventually be used as part of the net. And I do have notes, um, but so just bear with me as I go through these. Um, so what happens to make, a, you know, Johnny talked the last few Sundays about what makes the net work. So if it's a fishing net, then the net works when there's no holes in it, obviously, when the strings, as you can see in this kind of little net right here, you got knots in it, you got strings, so we're all connected. You know, we're not doing it alone. We also have to realize that God gave us these gifts. We didn't necessarily earn them. It was deposited in us. But how many know that just because you're given a gift does not mean it arrives and is perfect? So what I want to look at today is the life of King David. Now, a lot of you have heard the story about King David but I want to dive into that because as I was studying for this message, it was just really neat how God puts things in the Bible in a certain way. And I don't think that's by mistake, you know, even in the order of the words and the order of how he describes things. And let's look at this scripture, first scripture. And the Apostle Paul phrased it this way. It's in Romans 12, 5 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Have you ever met somebody that just had talent dripping off of them? I mean, it's just you just look at them and they just they got it. You know, and I've always thought that about Johnny because you know, when I met Johnny, it was through the radio station and at a, at a concert. And, you know, like I said, I wasn't the guy that would get up. You know, and that first time I met him, he's like, hey, Mike, will you be on the radio with me and talk about this concert? And I'm like, no. You know, and, and he pulls out a phone, and I didn't even know you could do that. You know, I thought to be on the radio, you'd have to go to a studio. And he just pulled out his phone and says, so, Mike, tell us about the concert today. And I'm like, wow. And he, I said, Johnny, what do I say? You know, and it, but it just drips off of him. You know, and he can get up here and speak. And it just, you know, it, it, but also restaurants. Have you ever been to a good restaurant and you know the cook there? And there's a lot of restaurant owners local here. And they just cook really, really good. You know, and we also see athletes, you know. And I always like to look back at Michael Jordan because I, I, I love how his life progressed. You know, he's a great basketball player in, in our history now. He's not doing any more. But when he did basketball in the beginning, I believe somebody told me he actually was here somewhere local, Wellington maybe. And he actually got kicked off his junior high, uh, basketball team in his high school year. But when you think about him, you think about that talent. You know, you think about um, Kevin Durant and how he shoots basketball. It's just amazing. But what we don't look at is the grind that they had to go through. We don't look at all the, the times that, say, Michael Jordan's friend said, let's go to the beach, and he said, no, I got I to gotta practice shooting. You know, or any of these stars you see, or these cooks, they actually spent the time to do that every single day. 
And it was the same with King David, and that's what I want to look at with King David. That you, most of you know the story, you know, King David was, before he was King David, he was David. He was one of many brothers. A prophet was called out to, to go to Jesse's household and find the next king and anoint him. But he went, and they went through all the brothers, and then David wasn't even there. You know, they considered him just, you know, too young. He was the throwaway kid. But the guy, the prophet kept on until they said, no, bring me, you got another one. And at that, that time, he was appointed king for the future, but Saul didn't know that. You know, Saul was the king at the time. Um, but at that point in time, God deposited something in David. And what we all think about is, okay, well, we know that he fought Goliath. So evidently, God put all this miraculous stuff in him that would get him to be king one day. But what we don't really know is how diligent he had to be and what was that gifting that God put in, put in him at that time to get him where he wants or where he wanted him. So that brings us to the first point today. The net works when we are diligent. So just like I talked about the, um, all the athletes and the cooks and whatever, whatever it is in your life, whatever that skill is, it requires some diligence. God will put it in you, but he asks you to put it together. You know, I, I, like Amazon, I don't know how many of you have been to Ikea. I think our closest one is in Charlotte. I love places like that because you can see pictures of the item. If you go in Ikea, the first floor or the second floor is all furniture and it's nice and you want to buy it and it's cheap or on Amazon but then after you go to buy it and you're on the the bottom floor when you go pick it up it doesn't look like that thing upstairs at all you know or when you arrive in the mail right or when it's shipped to you that does not look like that picture you have to put it together and a lot of times in my life I've had to realize that you know I I expect to be good at a certain thing you know when I started in technology I wasn't good at first but it took diligence it took that day after day, just really working on that particular skill. And what I want to look at is David. And this is just amazing when it, when it came out to me. David's first gift was playing the harp. But he didn't just, you know, miraculously become to, to play the harp. I mean, that wasn't just something that just happened. David had to learn how to play the harp. And, you know, uh, and it's called the lyre in the Bible, lyre or harp. But, you know, can you imagine how big a harp would have been back then? It's not just, a, you know, something that, that Bert could have brought in here. You know, it, it's a big old thing. So we don't know where, you know, it doesn't tell us in the Bible, but obviously he did a lot of practicing on it. He had to drag it around with him. And he had to learn and he had to practice every single day. And who knows how many practices that was. But I think what, what it shows us is there was some diligence in that. And it's just like that in your life. You know, we see all the time people that have great marriages, for example. You know, uh, speakers, great speakers. Um, like I said before, athletes. But, and that's what we want. You know, we want those things. But what we don't see is the behind the scenes of how often did they work on that. You know, Bert, amazing. Our, our worship team, amazing. You know, when they get up here and they do those three songs in the beginning. But what you don't see is the practices and the time it took to get to that point. But we'd all say we'd like to have that, right? Me, for example, I would love for somebody to go work out for me and me see the results of it. That would be great. You know, if somebody would just go to one of the gyms around here and then I wake up in the morning, whoa, that's awesome. Let me pay him another $10, you know, let me, let me buy him dinner. That's what we want, but that's just not going to work, amen? We have to really work on it ourselves, and we have to be diligent. So when you see people like this, when you see people that have it, when you see that they have a gift, you can, and, it's, and they're, they're operating in the net, which we would call Christianity, you know two things. Number one, God gave it to them. And number two, they had to put it together over time, just like you put together a bicycle or you put together that furniture. It just takes time. But we know that God will give you what you need when you need it, and whatever it might be. You know, if he expects you to, to do something then he will deposit it into you, and then you will work on it. Um, the next scripture I found was in 2 Timothy, and that's chapter 1, verse 14. And it's, uh, it's Paul talking to Timothy. He says, Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And, you know, we've learned that with the other sermon about how the Holy Spirit comes in and, and helps us. But that help has to be a diligent thing as well. You know, being in God's Word, seeing what God wants. That's really, really, really important. So what I've learned is I just must develop what God has deposited in me. And so for some of you, it's different things. Um, you say it's a gift of hospitality, you know, that you love doing things for others. You, you love hosting at your house. 
But, you know, that requires you to what? If you're going to have people over, you better put something in the oven, you know, or you better go out and buy something. There's, a, there's an action behind that. There's not just saying, hey, I feel like I'm good at hospitality. You know, if you're good at technology, there, there's more to that. And especially in, in my world in technology, if I was to take a year off and not learn anything, I would be obsolete. So it's a constant just learning and, and that diligence to do that. Um, there's a story told about a pastor that decided that he wanted to buy a farm, you know, out in the country. And th- this pastor, you know, just, he, he didn't know a lot about farming. I don't know a lot about farming. But so, well, what he did is he looked in the newspaper or whatever, he had a realtor, and he found a farm, and he went ahead and bought it. But then soon he realized that was a money pit. You know, there was, the barn was broken down. The, he tried to, to do crops. He, he had, I don't know what you have on a farm, but tractors and all. You know, there's so many pieces of equipment that he had to buy. So he, but he worked it, and he was diligent at it. And he, and he continued to work until it actually grew crops. And then one day, the, the farmer down the road, we'll call him Farmer John, he came and he said, Preacher, you and God did an amazing job at this land. What an amazing job. And, and the preacher just looked. He said, Well, if you think it looks good now, you should have seen it when just God had it. You know, <laughs> and you can laugh. It's okay. But that's what it is, right? You know, God will deposit it something in our life, but we have to work it. We have to be diligent at it before you can see that great field. So turn to somebody around you and say, you got to plow your field. Amen? That's right. Um, so, mainly on, for diligence, are you growing in your gift, and are you using it in the net? We, uh, we have a link on our website if you want to go to it later. There's things called spiritual gifts, and that could be anything, like I mentioned before, hospitality, serving. We have a lot of opportunities at this church to do things like that, the worship team. And there's actually a test you can take, a little thing where you just answer a bunch of questions. I think if you're in business, you've seen some, some skill tests to, to find out what you're good at. You know, are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Do you like leadership? Do you like to just you know, do the job and, and nobody bother you? you know, there's all types of gifts. But that's something to you know, look at, to what you could do to help the church. So back to David. David got, play, got called to play the harp because he was good. And it's actually in Scripture. 1 Samuel 16, 16 tells us, this was when, um, to set that up, Saul was the king at the time, you know, and he was running the kingdom, and he began having these nightmares and, and dreams and stuff. And so in 1 Samuel it says, Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful, skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Now think about that for a second. And this is the part that really just jumped out at me as I was preparing for this. They never said, look for a man after God's own heart, which we know that's David's reputation later on. They never said, look for a man that prays well. They said, look for a man that plays well. So now we're starting to see in Scripture how God, when God deposited that gift in David to play the harp, that gift actually now is starting to come into play for the rest of his purpose, right? Because we know eventually he's going to be king. But he had to get into Saul's home, you know, and literally because he was going to be playing for Saul when Saul went to sleep or to get Paul asleep, he was literally in Paul's bedroom playing for them. But would he have been there if he didn't start playing the harp? Like I said, this is not something that we really think about a whole lot, but it's true. You know, the first thing was the the gift. It was the skill. And then we know that somehow David developed that gift. But let's look at this list, the next verses, one more time. Um, It says, and this is the next slide. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician. You know, he plays the harp. A mighty man of valor, a warrior one prudent in speech, a handsome man, and the Lord is with them, with him. The last thing they mentioned there is that the Lord was with him. So that was not even part of their, what they were looking for. When they put up posters, you know, harp is wanted, that wasn't something on the list, as we can see. They found a guy like that, though. And how, though, did they see that he was a man of God? And, and what I was thinking about when I was reading this is they saw that he was a man of God because of the excellence in the way he played the harp. You know, he took that gift and he did it with excellence. And that's my next point today. The net works when we operate with excellence. So he didn't just barely play the harp. You know, he didn't just say, well, I, 
I feel that God maybe put this in my life or this hobby. I'll just do it once in a while. No, he had to actually play the harp and practice and do it with excellence. So that's what we, you know, do too. When we feel that there's something in our life, we need to work on it with excellence. You know, that's how you grow in it. And we all know that God likes good stuff anyway. And the Bible studies I have, especially in Hawaii, I was younger when I was there. So I had a younger group, like middle school, high school age. And now it's college age. You know, as I get older, they get older, that kind of thing. But what I'd always used to tell the, the young people is, whatever you do, you can do it unto God because God likes good things. You know, and it also, just like with David playing the harp well, it actually increases that testimony without you even having to say anything about it. So if you're in school and, you know, that's where God has you at the moment, what do you need to do? You need to get good grades. Not, not to impress the teachers or because your parents are going to take the car away, because God wants you to do that. And when you make good grades in school, then you're basically showing people, hey, you know, you don't have to wear a cross around your neck. You don't have to do anything like that. You just, people will find out that you love God because you're doing things with excellence. You know, so like David said, he got the job, or he didn't say it, but he did get the job because he was excellent. And I love that. I mean, that is just, you know, something, in, and like the video showed before, sometimes people confuse skill and excellence because they'll get caught up in the thing of like, well, you know, God is not for perfectionism. But I'm not talking about perfectionism. I'm talking about if you have a business, for example, if you have a Christian business, you know, you could, you could just have a mediocre business, put a big cross on your website or on your door or wear it on you, but if you're not doing the job of your business well, then, then you're not showing people what God is worthy of, amen? You know, so that's what we have to do, you know, no matter what it is, we do it with excellence. And it is, applies to your kids, too. When I was in Hawaii and my sons were little, uh, they wanted to play inline hockey. They didn't have ice hockey in Hawaii. You know, that probably wouldn't work out too well. But inline hockey was a big thing, and a lot of kids like to do that. So the first thing, they were like, let's get, you know, you know registered. We get registered. And then, you know, kids are going to want this anyway. So they're like, Dad, let's go get the best hockey gear. You know, so what would happen is that they had these inline rinks all over the island, and you would go, and there'd always be people camped out there selling the best stuff, the best hockey sticks, the best pads, the best helmets. So the first time we went, you know, they were like, Dad, Dad, buy us this. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, that's a lot of money. But the one guy called me over. He said, hey, let me tell you something. Let me give you some advice. Have they played before? And I was like, no, they hadn't played before. He's like, don't let your kids be those kids. I'm like, those kids? What kids? He's like, the kids that have all the nice equipment, but they don't have a lick of skill. You know, you've got to get them having that. Get, borrow the older people stuff. There's plenty. There, there was actually all the teams had a basket of old stuff, old pads, old, you know, helmets, Old sticks are starting to <laughs> chip a little bit. But, you know, that's what you start out with. You start out with that. And you, so, you know, let your kids learn that too. Whatever it is, don't invest in it, you know, with that money too fast. Get that skill built up. And, you know, that's what, I'm sure King David did not have the best harp in, in town. I mean, he probably had something that they made. It's interesting to think about even having a harp back then. Like, who, who was the harp maker? <laughs> but you don't want to be the person with, all the gear and no game. You, let's, let's do it a different way. But either way, for God, if it's for God, it ought to be good. So I didn't buy the kids the, the good stuff. I, I let them have hand-me-downs. And then once they got good, then I bought them the better stuff. And actually, I made them work for the better stuff because then the value of it was much, much better. You know, if, we, if we're musicians, if, if we're whatever we are, and what happens if, if you get the good stuff too fast, you will skip the lessons. You will, you will skip the excellence that you have to work in and that diligence. So you don't want the good stuff in the beginning. That's why God sometimes will put that skill in you, in your mind, in your heart, but he won't tell you what you're getting ready to do with it. Um, and that goes for everybody, no matter what your business, what your skill. Um, so just remember, excellence is not perfectionism. You, perfectionism basically says that you need to be the best. And that's rooted in a, a competitive spirit. And you know, a competitive spirit, that's, that's not of God. It, excellence basically says, I want to bring my God the best. So that's what we've talked about with the worship team. You know, we would rather focus on bringing God our best than having people in the front that are just there for themselves. You know, we just, as a church, we decided that we don't want that. You know, we, if, if anybody that would ever apply for the worship team, they're just like, hey, and, and this happened in, you know, most of you know I was in a large church in Hawaii, you know, 
we were up to 40,000 people at one time. And so, you know, we had a, you know, it's like big schools. You, you have the best football players, the best everything. We had the best musicians, but some of them, they wanted to be on stage just so they could go get a job somewhere in Hawaii. At one, you know, there's a lot of entertainment industry in Hawaii. But we had to be very, very careful about that because that wasn't the right heart. You know, we wanted people to understand that if you're up on stage, you have an audience of one, you know, and, and you have to bring excellence, not perfectionism. So that was another lesson I learned in Hawaii. Um, this other scri- scripture that I have up here is Psalms 90, 17. And this was really just, that this spoke to me. It says, may the favor of, our, of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. And just think about that. Establish the work of our hands. You know, if we ask God to, to build a skill in us or, or give us a gifting or, you know, if we want to do something, build something, we have to give him some good word, wood to work with. And the wood would be, you know, our thoughts and our actions, our diligence, our excellence. You know, that's exactly what we want him to do. Martin Luther said, and Martin Luther was, you know, an amazing uh, just man that just tried to, to seek after God and, and get cut through all the religion and, and see, you know, how he could best serve God. And he, he had this quote, and you can, you can find it online, but it says, The maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not because she sings a Christian hymn while she sings, but God likes clean floors. Amen? You know, and, and we see that time and time again. You know, it's, it's, there's lots of scriptures in the Bible that talks about things like that, about the lady that gave her, her last two cents. It's, you know, God looks at the heart of what we're doing. And what I've learned, which is, is a, was a big thing in my life, and, and I, like I said, I learned it in Hawaii, but, and I mentioned this to Boris last week when he was over with Pastor Boris. He, God doesn't see us as we see ourselves. And we kind of know that from listening to Scripture and going to church. But there's another big thing that I learned pretty quickly. God doesn't allow other people to see us as we see ourselves. You know? And that, that's how you get over the, the anxieties and the fears and things like that. So what I see myself is, is not the same as what you see me as. Because God allows me to be what I need to be at the time of my gifting. When I used to travel in, in Hawaii, they actually thought I was Hawaiian, which was funny to me. Because if anybody knows much about Hawaii, there's, there's all these things like, you know, white people shouldn't go to Hawaii because they'll be teased. And there's a word called haole. And, and haole actually means person without breath because, you know, back in the day when, when the missionaries and the white people went to Hawaii, Hawaiians would always get right up each other's face. And I don't know how they did this because I don't even know if they had breath mints or toothbrushes, but they would breathe on each other. And so when the white men came, they didn't do that because, you know, white men were more sophisticated or whatever. So they would call them haoles or people without breath. So, you know, I was a young person when I went there, so I got all the warnings like, be careful, just, just be nice, you know, because they'll call you a haole and tell you to go back to the mainland. So I didn't want that. You know, I didn't want confrontation. But nobody ever did that to me. And in fact, like, you know, I'd met a lot of Hawaiians, you know, when I was there. I went to the University of Hawaii, and there was just Hawaiian people everywhere. And they had always asked me, uh, you know, where's your family? What, what school did you graduate from in Hawaii? I was like, wow, that is, that's crazy. You know, and I was in Hawaii 17 years, so a lot happened. I got a job where I was traveling a lot, had to go to Germany one time. And then on the plane, people were like, the waitresses are like talking to me in German. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not German. You know, and then I have the Carolina slash Hawaii accent, which is a funny accent. You know, I've lost most of that now. Because when I was in North Carolina, I had the y'all. And when I went to Hawaii, it was the you guys, you know. But when I went to Germany, it was just all mixed up, you know. But, but they thought I was, you know, German. And I thought, God, why is that? And that's when God spoke to me and said, people will see people as I need them to see them. So all you need to do is be obedient and do what I've asked you to do. And that was big for me. And I actually shared that with, with several people along the way that God just led me into their paths. You know, people that were just really upset and they just feel like they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And I would just look at them and tell them that. And they said that just made a big difference in their life is to realize that go with the gifting God gave you. Go with that um, whatever he's put in you and deposited into your life and let God take care of the rest. You know, like I don't have to be scared to get up here and speak because you're hearing what God wants you to hear. You're seeing what God wants you to see. I just have to do the diligence. One more little story about Hawaii, which was amazing during this whole time I was learning. Um, before I was at New Hope, I was at a really small campus ministry on, in college, and they had a guitarist there that was probably, I hate to say it, he was better than you, <laughs> but he was a good guitarist. He was so good 
I think it's called Musicians Institute in California, just a very famous place. He was so good, and I think he was about maybe 19, that they asked him to come there. And I mean, I thought, I think back then it was like 100000 a year, but they gave him a scholarship, and they saw him, and they recruited him. He was so good. The problem was, if he left, we wouldn't have a guitarist. I'd never played before in my life. You know, I was not a guitarist. I, was, I couldn't even keep a beat, you know. But he, we were good friends, and he said, hey, listen, I'll be gone for six months. I want you to play for me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, that made absolutely no sense in the world. How could I play and, and take his place for, you know, six whole months? And he, he said, oh, by the way, I'm leaving in six weeks. I'll just sit with you and teach you what you need to know to get up there and play. And I'm thinking, you know, when you're young, you're like, I can do it. I can do anything. So I did. I sat with him for six weeks, and that went by just very, very quickly. I think I learned C and G chords. I mean, it wasn't much. I mean, he, he knew he couldn't teach me the, the intricacies. But because I sat at his feet, because I you know, prayed about it, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to do that, I tried. I was diligent in trying to do that. Every single day I would sit with him, just for at least an hour. So by the end of the six weeks, he left. I'll never forget the practice. We were at a little high school. We got up there. You know, and the rest of the band was there, and they're looking at me like, wow. You know, and I had the guitar. Hey, I bought a nice guitar. It was shiny, but it didn't matter. I was thinking, how in the world, you know, you, it's just that the fright comes over you like, this is going to be horrible. Let me tell the sound guy to just mute me, and I'll look like I'm playing. But I knew that's not what God wanted. You know, they needed that peace. They needed that rhythm. And I remember starting to play, and honestly, I don't know what happened. Some, you know, the Holy, not something, it was the Holy Spirit took over me, and I just played perfectly. And people came up and, and said, wow, this is great. And then my first thought is, I'm going to make some money doing this. I'm going to be great. <laughs> but the problem was, right after that, I didn't, couldn't do it anymore. You know, after service was over, it was just like, I went home, and I'm like, what? Did I really get up there and do that? But what I thought about that is, God deposited it. I did the diligence. I tried to be as excellent as possible. Then the Holy Spirit came in and took over and it made it all right. So it, I was used in that time period. I can't play right now, you know, but during that time when I was doing that, God intervened. You know, it's, it says, a, a psalmist says, Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic and excellent is your name. And when we do things that God asks us to do, that's when we kind of enter into that, and, and then we become part of the net. You know, we're a net here at Harbor Church, and it's, it's amazing, like this morning when everybody was here and setting up, and, and the team just... You know, they kind of knew I was speaking today, so they, they got around me, and they're trying their best not to make me nervous. But then Mike Moore came and said, Mike, there's 10 busloads of people outside, you know. And I'm like, what? But, you know, it's just that, isn't that awesome, though, to have that net, that team to surround you? They prayed over me and everything, and that's, that's just really, really awesome, and I, I just love that. My next point, my last point, actually, and I'm not going to do like Johnny and have five closing points. This is the last, last point. If you're watching Johnny, hey. Um, the net works when we operate in our uniqueness. And, and that's something big with me, too, because, like I said, God lets people see you as, they want, as he wants them to see you. You know, when I was young, um, probably about 25, I started praying, Lord, you can do whatever you want, but don't take my hair. Please, Lord, don't take my hair or I'll never be able to go anywhere. Well, we can see the result of that. I have beautiful hair. God didn't take it. Amen? No. But that's part of when that started with God saying, it doesn't matter what you look like, whether you have hair or not. And, and I think there's something in all of us, you know, that we know we're a little bit different. We know we're a little bit unique. And that's the other thing that I just got that confirmation from reading this scripture with David. Um, let's look at verse 18. And it says, we, we read this earlier, but let's read it again. One of the servants said to Paul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. And then you skip through the other things that they said about him, all these other things. And they said he's a warrior. So how many times have you guys in your life seen a real tough guy somewhere, you know, at the gym or down the street, and, and, and your friend's like, wow, he's tough. You know, do you think you could take him? No, I can't. But guess what I heard? He's an awesome heart player. You know, what I mean? have you guys ever heard that or watched um, Sesame Street, one of these things, don't go together, that, that song they would sing? Well, that's kind of like it is with King David. I mean, you know, those are two contradictions. And I think a lot of us live through that. You know, when I started uh, in tech in Hawaii, I did not know that I would become part of a church. You know, I started in it at the uh, University of Hawaii. 
they, it was actually when the internet started, which is, and I said how old I am. The internet started, and the University of Hawaii was the first university that, that would allow email addresses to go out to students. They kind of kick-started that for all the colleges. And, you know, it's hard to believe a world without email, but back in the day, only professors and, and people like that had them. But they decided to give it to students, and they hired me to do that. You know, that was part of my job there. So I really got deep into technology. But, and I thought that'd be my life. I thought I would just keep doing technology. But somewhere along the way, because I kept working on technology, I was involved. I, got, I started going to New Hope. And like I said, it was a big church, and they had a big staff. But, and then I started knowing, you know, I, I knew Pastor Wayne just from, you know, he's the guy that spoke up on stage. But I would have never saw myself flying with him all over the country and, and being his right-hand man and, and being on the management team. I just thought, well, maybe I could serve somewhere in the church, which I did. Because I like technology, I did sound for a while for the junior high ministry. Then the junior high ministry, I got friends with his son, Aaron. And I don't know how it happened exactly, but Aaron, was deci Aaron decided to go to the mainland for college. We went to the airport to see him off, and that was the days when you actually could go to the gate. And we were at the gate, we told Aaron bye, and there was a bunch of people there. And as we turned to leave... You know, Pastor Wayne kind of ended up with me, and like I said, we didn't know each other very well at all. You know, it was just kind of seeing each other. But Pastor Wayne turned to me, and he said, Mike, Aaron says you know a lot about technology. And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. He said, well, we lost our IT guy recently, and I need to replace him. And we need, you know, we need a really good guy. And they tell me you're the best, you know, at what you do. See, kind of the, to me, it parallels with the whole King David story. And so I said, okay, great. He said, well, Call, uh, call our church administrator. His name was Richard Wiley. That's a Hawaiian name. He said, call him and set up a time to go by and talk to him. And I'm like, okay, I will. And as soon as I turn away, I'm not calling him. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, I, that, this is just not for me. I'm not, I'm not ready for something this big. I'm not, I can't do that. Got in the car, was driving back home. Before I could even get home, the phone rang. Answered it. Hey, Mike, this is Richard Wiley. Pastor Wayne just called me and said to call you. <laughs> How they found my number, I have no idea. But I knew God knew that I said, I'm not going to call him, and I wouldn't have called him. But he called me. They, I went in, started working in technology at the church, didn't know that because of my technology gift, God would also use us to be the first church in America to stream on the Internet live. And that was cool. You know, CNN came out. A bunch of places came out. We did, uh, there was a magazine that did a story on us. And then I was named the first Internet pastor. Well, I, I didn't know that would happen. But you see the skill and the gifting that God put into me as technology, and because I was diligent at it, then that happened. And then before long, Pastor Wayne said, hey, you know, because technology and, and the, the, this modern part of Christianity is so big, you need to be on my management team. You know, that was that, that step. And then the next step is, you need to fly with me everywhere because we need to set up all these, you know, amazing things to reach people. We need to redeem technology and use it in excellence to reach the kingdom. So, I just look back at that and think, wow, what? you know, if I was never in technology, I would have never been at the church, you know, because he surely did not get me to come there and hire me because I was a great speaker, I was a great man of God or any of that. He didn't know any of that. All he knew was, my son told me that you were a great guy in technology. Same thing with me and Johnny. Johnny met me when we were at a concert. Well, um, I was part of Covenant Church, and he needed to use one of the facilities. He uh, was telling me about how they were going to do the concert and they wanted, you know, they had sponsors, and I was just like, hey, I know it's the day of, but what if we put a cool video together that has the sponsors in it, and you know, that's something you can play in the in-between times, and Johnny's like, yeah, that sounds good. I, I did the video, Johnny, like, wow, that's amazing, you know, that's, that's great. We didn't talk again for a few years, but, or maybe a year, but then later, we got to talking about the radio station, and I helped him with some tech stuff there, and then one day out here, I think he's told the story several times, we felt God saying, let's start Harbor Church, you know, and it's just neat, you know, and I'm sharing that because that's how those things can be related. You know, that's how King David started playing the harp, because think about it. If he would have just been a warrior, he would have never got to King Saul. He would have never got into that place he needed to be to eventually be the king. You know, if he had just been a harp player, I think he couldn't have defeated Goliath. You know, it took more than playing harp because he couldn't have played Goliath to death. He had to have that warrior part of him. He had to have that braveness. He had to be a man of God that knew not just hope that when he threw that stone or the sling, you know, stone, he had to know that that would take out his opponent. 
So that's what let's us, I mean, just think about it. We're contradictions. You know, I was a contradiction. A lot of us are contradictions in what we think we need to do and what eventually God will have for us. But I say go for it. Whatever that thing is that God has deposited into you, whether it's music, hospitality, serving, teaching, whatever it is, do it with all your heart and be diligent about it. And then be excellent about it. Even though they don't seem to go together, that's what happens. Last story about Hawaii. And I'm going to really find out who's with me on this because I think a few people will be with me and a few people will probably not be with me at all. When I went to Hawaii, the one thing nobody ate there, and I had ate it all my life because everybody in my family did. Joel, throw that picture up. Does everybody know what that is right there? Banana and mayonnaise sandwiches. Raise your hand if you will have ate one of those or you would. Wow, I'm back home. Amen. <laughs> nobody in Hawaii thought that. You know, they were like, so of course I could go to the store and buy all that stuff. And the first time, I just like I said, I didn't know. The first time I ate it with a bunch of people, they thought I was crazy. You know, what a contradiction. And if you think about it, you know, mayonnaise is more like they thought of it. Okay, you put that on hamburgers and you put that on things with meat and, and stuff like that. It doesn't go with fruit. But isn't it awesome? I mean, to me, when you mix it together, and my grandmother even and used to take pears, cut them in half, and, you know, if you cut a pear, you know, take the seed out, I guess, and there's a little bowl-looking thing in the pear, she'd throw mayonnaise right on that. And you'd eat it. Oh, my gosh, that was good. And in, scientifically, I thought there's just something about fruit that takes mayonnaise and changes it from, you know, a lot of these guys are, they say the young people don't like it. I think as older people, we've done a bad service. We haven't made them try it because they, they think I'm crazy, too. But you know what? It goes together, you know, and when we eat it, it, it just makes sense. And that's what I think of like the kingdom. It's like a parable almost. God puts it together. If you need a harp, God will give you a harp. If you need an arrow and a bow, he'll give you a bow. If you need to be a warrior, he'll give you a warrior. And God works through our weirdness. Amen. Aren't we glad that God works through our weirdness? That's helped me out more than probably anything ever is to know that God can use me no matter what I look like, no matter what size I am, no matter what my voice sounds like, God can use me if I'm just willing and if I'm just diligent to practice. You know, that's why when Johnny asked me to do this service, I was like, of course, you know, but I'm going to work on it. <laughs> you know, I knew about a month ago, I think it's been almost a month, because they were actually going to be today in uh, New Jersey at Jen's family for a um, baby shower, but of course that didn't happen, they're, they're at home. But, you know, we went ahead because I did prepare for a month. So, But I wanted to prepare because I wanted to show God, listen, I don't think I'm worthy of doing this. I don't know if I can get up there and faint or not. I don't even know that I can talk more than 10 minutes. I did, you know, share one time at Harvard when we first started, but I spoke for 10 minutes and then I played a video. So Johnny told me, absolutely, you cannot do that this time. But I was like, I can get 10 minutes, but can I get 30? And I've actually I've been going 40, which is amazing. Um, but we're wrapping it up. Um, just know that God works through our weirdness. Let me get to the right point here. And sometimes it's okay to be both. As we know, go back to King David. In chapter 16, he was a harpist. That's what he was. He needed to be hired. God needed him to get in, basically in King Saul's bedroom to put him to sleep at night. He had to earn that trust of King Saul, and that got him from playing a harp to being one of the mighty warriors. But as we know, that also almost got him killed. But he didn't get killed, amen. He ended up taking over the kingdom because that was what God wanted. You know, that's what the prophet said, I'm anointing the next king because Saul decided to go a little bit crazy. So sometimes we have to be both. And that's kind of what I want to leave us with today is just that thought of we need to just seek God, pray, ask him what our thing is that he needs and it doesn't matter our age it doesn't matter our walk in life we just need to be diligent excellent and celebrate our uniqueness every single day and that's what makes the net work amen all right so now what i want to do is i'm we're going to close but we are going to do the same thing we're going to take communion so if the ushers would come forward for that